Yes. Hi. Um, can everyone hear me? Is this no? Is this loud enough? Louder? Okay. Um, Manuel de Landa was born in 1952 in Mexico City and has lived in Manhattan since 1975 where he began his career as an independent filmmaker, showing his films in clubs and museums around the world. In 1980, he acquired an industrial grade computer and became a programmer and computer artist, writing his own software for several years. He is author of two philosophy books, War in the Age of Intelligent Machines from 1991 and A Thousand Years of Nonlinear History in 1997, and of many philosophical essays published in various journals. He teaches two seminars at Columbia University on theories of self-organizational and urban, of self-organizing -organi systems and urban history and the philosophy of structures and materials and lectures extensively in the United States and in Europe on nonlinear dynamics and the philosophy of science and technology, including the topics of artificial intelligence and artificial life. Our lecture series, Butterfly, partially takes its name from a theory of the butterfly effect, a concept of our physical reality built upon dynamic and unstable conditions, rather than upon linear processes from one stage of development to the next. The world is dynamic to the degree that small changes can cause major waves in the behavior of parts, fields, and energy. Manuel de Landa's A Thousand Years of Nonlinear History is a book that contains three major philosophical essays concerned with the investigation of human behavior in relation to its physical and biological environment. It is a history framed in terms of stuff undergoing different kinds of intensification along three registers of the flows of matter, the geological, the biological, and the linguistic, Delanda develops concepts for reflecting on the processes in which humanity has become hybridized over the past thousand years. However, these three narratives are not seen as three separate spheres, each more advanced than the previous one, but dynamically coexisting flows of material, lavas, genes, and norms. Based on the Annals School and Fernand Braudel's global history, Delanda's is a world constituted by the forces of many conjunctural circumstances rather than a linear narration of particular events or individual agents. He tracks the interacting geophysical formations, ecological systems, and demographic mechanisms that inform history at several temporal scales. We can think of his book as a kind of taxonomy of rates of change, where events and personalities become, according to Bradell, only surface disturbances, crests of foam that the tides of history carry on their strong backs. Through the philosophical legacy of Deleuze and Guattari, Delanda formulates a theory of history which sees wind, rocks, oceans, bodies, cities, bacteria, and words, all as expressions of the same mass energy. Rather than working within a metaphysical line of thought concerned with essences, origins, and being, he views the world as a fluxive and temporal state of becoming, a constant process of self-organization characterized by intensities of difference. For architects, historians, planners, and urbanists working in Los Angeles, a city of sprawl that grows at a phenomenal rate, Delanda's concept of becoming allows us to recapture the possibility of working in the city without becoming subjectivists. It helps us to activate the various cultural and economic challenges of the city, which inevitably influence the architectural milieu. Please help me in welcoming our speaker tonight, Manuel Delanda. <laughs> 
everyone. Uh, I'm going to uh, break down my presentation into two parts, one in which I'm going to be reading this essay that I wrote uh, for a Rio de Janeiro conference called The Role of Cities in the New Philosophy of History. Uh, and then I will just read from my notes a little bit to try to complement uh, the ideas in the paper and just to bas basically give you uh, the outline or the rough uh, edges of what the philosophy of history that informs my two books, the, the War in the Age of Intelligent Machines book and the, new, and the new book. But before I start, let me just give you in a nutshell what the basic idea is. As, as architects, you are often called upon to think about context, about the social context of the structures that you create. And, uh, and of course, we inherit those concepts about society from 19th century sociology or 20th century economics or a variety of other social sciences that, that provide us with the tools to think about this. But unfortunately, and this is something that has only been brought to light in the last 10, 20 years, the ideas about society that we inherited from the past have something very definitely wrong about them. And I just want to start right now by contrasting what used to be with the new ideas that are coming out in a, in a brief image so that you can keep that in mind throughout the talk. The basic idea then is that a, your orthodox sociology, and this includes Durkheim, uh, Parsons, Karl Marx, uh, and you name it, begin their study of society at the top. In other words, they assume that there is this thing called society or culture as a whole. So you, we, we get all these terms like Western culture, the capitalist system, uh, the society itself uh, as an organism. Uh, the, the organism metaphor, of course, was very, very important for, for say, Durkheim. But also from Hegelian dialectics, the, whole, the very idea of a totality was also very influential in Marx. And so we inherit these ideas, and we many times uncritically accept them. So we think that there is this totality called society. And then the analysis becomes a top-down analysis. We begin at the top and then begin dissecting it and analyzing it until we get to the, to the bottom of individuals that make up this whole. But in a, in a, the, the main philosophical problem with that is that we assume systematicity. Just to, just to keep at, uh, the, this very clear, let's think just simply about the capitalist system. No one ever, ever proved that indeed the economy was a whole system, that every single stitch, schools, prisons, factories, uh, barracks, hospitals, and all the different uh, institutional forms that inhabit a, a, a city, in fact, all fit together in such a way as to form a system. So we simply assume that systematicity. The same thing happens when we talk about Western culture. We assume a certain amount of homogeneity that is simply not there. Uh, the opposite of that, the opposite of this top-down analysis which assumes systematicity or takes systematicity as a given and then proceeds down, is has been made possible by computer simulations, particularly in the area of uh, artificial life, uh, in which now we can try to approach things from, uh, from the bottom up. That is, we unleash within a virtual environment a population of entities and then try to tease out from that population larger scale holes. In other words, for instance, just to mention the most obvious example, the most famous example of artificial life, which is those uh, virtual birds that, that, that someone invented a few years ago called boids. Uh, this person, whose name unfortunately I can't remember right now, uh, gave this flying virtual birds a few local rules as to how to interact. If you're too close to, to the rest of the flock, get a little farther away. If you're too farther away, get a little closer. The simple rules like that, and then unleashed the, 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 the set of birds to see if, they, if the emergent behavior of a flock, 
if this behavior of the, of the flock as a whole could be teased out of these elements. In artificial life, it's uh, a sin to cook into the, the, the computer simulation any kind of global rule. Because if you, if you already put in some equations or some other, or, or some subroutines or whatever that force this, this population to have a coherent behavior as a whole, then in a way you're already cheating. Because the whole point of the simulation is to try to see if the mechanisms through which uh, a properties that are more than the sum of their parts, synergetic or synergistic properties, like Buck, Mr. Fuller used to call them, can emerge spontaneously from the interactions between the elements. If we cook in some form, some constraint or some global rule that informs these interactions, then in fact we don't know how it happens in reality, because in reality there is no such rule for flocking behavior. So what was interesting about this first artificial life thing was that, for instance, when the birds began to fly together, they not only kind of stuck to each other in a flock formation, but whenever they found uh, an obstacle, they would actually perform flock-like behavior, like dividing themselves into two groups and then rejoining after the obstacle had been, had been uh, encountered, or rather had been passed uh, uh, back, meaning the guy who designed this thing did not put a specific rule for whenever you find an obstacle, branch out, and then come back together. That behavior came spontaneously from the virtual birds. And that is what in artificial life is meant by a bottom-up strategy. So ideally, and of course we cannot do this yet, our study of society would come from the bottom up. We would deploy within a virtual environment a set of artificial agents being a, the, the virtual human beings with their own decision-making power and decision-making rules and so on. From the interactions between these human beings, we would expect institutions to come out. For instance, in the 13th century in Venice, uh, the stock market of Venice still didn't exist. Now today is, of course, like any other stock market, an institution. And it began simply as some rich merchants exchanging, not stocks, they didn't have joint stock companies yet, but they did have uh, uh, loans that they had made to a king or some other forms of paper that they could exchange. They used to meet at a place in Venice and through informal rules, exchange these pieces of paper. Little by little, from these actual interactions, and as the informal rules became formalized, an institution emerged. Eventually, they acquired their own building. As I say in my book, they became mineralized. They had this mineral exoskeleton to house now these new practices, now informed by formal rules and a formal charter for the institution. So from the bottom up, from the actual practices of Venetian merchants and through, uh, and through time, as the rules became formalized, the stock market emerged and now it became a new entity, but also an individual entity. It's the individual stock market of Venice, the individual stock market of Antwerp, Amsterdam, London, New York. It's not a totality. From the interactions now between institutions, between stock markets, between other forms of commercial institutions, between uh, governmental institutions, ecclesiastical institutions, and so on, larger scale entities emerge, like such as cities. For instance, Venice itself was born from the interactions between the governments of villages, of the villages that make the kind of proto-Venetian uh, city, from those interactions, the city itself emerged. But again, not as a totality, not as, a, not as some whole that now can be studied as an organism, but simply as yet another individual. This is what is important about cities, that they are individual, Venice, Los Angeles, New York, and so on. From the interactions between cities, systems of cities emerge. For instance, there are hierarchies of cities uh, 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 which have a landlocked capital typically at the top, uh, and I'm going to be reading about this in a second. There are other s systems of cities which are more, less hierarchical, more of a network type. And these hierarchies of cities, for instance, the hierarchy under Paris, the hierarchy under Lyon, were instrumental in organizing the space 
which eventually would become France as a nation state. But again, a nation state which is an individual, not a totality. So in short, a bottom-up approach begins with a population of individuals from whose interactions institutions emerge, then a population of institutions from whose interactions cities emerge, then populations of cities from whose interactions larger scale entities such as systems of cities or nation states emerge. And at no point you have a totality. It is within this new ontology Ontology, remember, is the word philosophers use for what they, uh, the kinds of entities that they consider to actually exist in the world. This new ontology does not have totalities in it because they, these things never form a, whole, a, 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 a super entity. At every level, all we have is individuals only of larger scales. But it is within this new ontology of pure individuals that cities have acquired a key role because now they are not just these this middle-sized entities that no one knows what to do. If you, if you believe in society as a whole, cities seem to be this kind of awkward things because you, you have the relations between the individual and society. You have these two poles, the individual human being and society. And these intermediate levels, institutions and cities, don't seem to fit anywhere. They are just there, but you, know, you really concentrate on the two ends of the, con of the continuum. But from a bottom-up approach, cities become very specific a, a context for uh, interactions between uh, uh, institutions, interactions between human beings. And history, of course, becomes a much more elaborate affair. It becomes like a parallel computer in which several streams of time go on simultaneously because there's a story that you can tell at the level of individual decision makers which goes on. Then there's a story that you can tell at the level of institutions. For instance, Michel Foucault's story about how prisons began to affect the way barracks and schools and hospitals began were, were being built. That's a story at the level of institutions. Then there's a story which happens at the level of cities, as I will read in a second a few details. And so you have this parallel streams of history, uh, all of them going on simultaneously, uh, which make now urgent that we go back and reanalyze history with this new schema to see all the things that we might have missed when we when we consider that our ontology was a simple one of human individuals and then society. So it is, this is the context in which I want to uh, 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 deliver my talk today. And as I said, even though computers are not ready to actually allow us to create these worlds within them, they are getting there, particularly if we begin to coming up with schemes as to how to use the internet as a whole. You know, you've probably all heard of how uh, certain uh, cryptographic codes and so on now can be broken when programmers all over the world break up the task and begin in parallel working on that particular problem. In other words, the internet is in a way a parallel computer already, but we don't have yet the software or the cooperation between all the servers around the world which would allow us to, in fact, tap into this enormous uh, uh, computer to begin running this simulation so that we can start getting a better idea of the complexities of history because we've tended for a long time to oversimplify this and to and therefore to get a very bad idea as to what our options for the future are. So let me start by reading this paper and I'm going to actually, believe it or not, going to time myself here because if I, I'm very long-winded. I already used up an hour of my time. That's great. Uh, it's about cities, but it, it will also touch about ideas about economics. Because one of the tasks that I think is crucial for our time is to get rid of the idea that there is such a thing as the capitalist system. Particularly now that capitalism has gotten global, we need to begin cutting the enemy down to size, so to speak. Instead of begin to think about this multinational capitalism as a multi-headed hydra that is impossible to stop anymore, and therefore begin to just uh, uh, kind of fall back into a postmodern cynicism about 
constant crit criticism and constant self-doubt and constant cynicism in, 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 in the face of this uh, uh, monster. And to me, the important thing today is precisely to begin cutting the enemy down to size. So that to, to us to be able to see what possible ways out of this situation we have. I try to do that with the military in my first book. The second book does a similar thing for capitalism, and it knows that this paper I will read deepens a little bit that analysis of the book. So let me begin now. The work of economic historian Fernand Brodel, exemplified by his three-volume book entitled Civilization and Capitalism, has provided philosophers not only with the raw materials for a new conception of material and economic history, but also with several new concepts, such as the coexistence of several temporal scales informing the flow of history. The new economic data unearthed by Brodel and his school cries out for philosophical interpretation as it contradicts much of what standard accounts have to say on the subject, specifically, the rigid, it contradicts the rigid periodizations of history that we, have be, that we have become accustomed to, such as a division of Western history into feudal, capitalist, and socialist modes of production, or its division into agricultural, industrial, and information ages. When you believe in totalities, it's very easy to make this silly periodizations because, well, then society forms this whole organism, and therefore, as an organism, it can go like organisms do go from, from childhood to, to adolescence to adulthood. And so we begin to believe that, in fact, society forms this organism that goes through stages of development. First, it was feudal, then it became in industrial. Now we are in the mature uh, period of the information age. This, of course, has all kinds of political consequences because third world countries that have not become industrialized feel that they have to go through the Industrial Revolution, whereas, in fact, as I'm going to show in a second, the Industrial Revolution was not a necessary stage of development. It was simply a particular paradigm of production which took over due to economic power and not because it was a necessary stage for everybody to go through. Yet, the challenge which Brodel's data, and again, Brodel, is, Brodel and his school were the first ones in this century to actually go and look at the dust of history, to actually go and check the banks, books of Florentine banks in the 15th century, to go and check the merchant bank, I mean the merchant books of, of uh, 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 Dutch merchants in the 17th century, to actually go and check where the capital went, where came and went to, uh, instead of simply assuming that Marx had already done all this, or that Durkheim had already done all this, they went and rechecked the whole thing, generating an incredibly large database of new information that, in fact, overflows on all sides this rigid periodizations that we have become accustomed to. One of the philosophical consequences of taking this challenge seriously is directly ontological. That is, is concerned with what a philosophy takes as truly existing in the world. Specifically, we have become accustomed since the 19th century to speak of society as a whole, sometimes justifying this by invoking Hegelian totalities, some other times by using the organism as a metaphor, and viewing society as a functional totality. The new ontological stand that I'm proposing, on the other hand, does not include totalities of any kind, or more exactly, it refuses to simply assume systematicity. The new ontology does include wholes that are more than the sum of their parts, but in each case, it demands to know what specific historical processes gave, gave rise to that whole. That is, it demands to know the source of its systematicity. We might say that an ontology which simply assumes the existence of wholes follows a top-down approach from the taken-for-granted whole to the parts that it constitutes, while the new approach is bottom-up. That is, it approaches entities at any given level of scale in terms of populations of interaction, interacting entities at the level immediately below. In other words, the new ontology includes only emergent wholes and emergent wholes which are individuals. Methodologically, 
This philosophical maneuver implies a rejection of the theoretical foundations of both orthodox economics as well as orthodox sociology. Although the former neoclassical microeconomics, for instance, does begin its analysis at the bottom of society, at the level of the individual decision maker, it does so in such a way that it atomizes these components, each one of which is modeled as maximizing his or her individual satisfaction, called marginal utility, in isolation from the others. In other words, even though microeconomics does begin with individual decision makers, each one is, is modeled as a rational computer, so to speak, that's computing all the time, you know, that has a set of preferences. I like steak better than ice cream, but I like ice cream better than spinach, and so on. Some scale in which these preferences are, are ranked. And then they, they view every consumer as if every time they make a purchase, every time they make a, a sale, they were going through their, through their preferences with this optimizing computation to optimize their satisfaction. So the moment you, of course, atomize individuals that way, you don't get them interacting. And if they don't interact, nothing of a larger scale is going to come out of this, which is why microeconomics doesn't include institutions, let alone cities. Each decision maker is further atomized by assuming that the, that the decisions in questions are made on a case-by-case -case basis constrained only by budgetary limitations, leaving out of consideration the question of norms and values that constrained individual action in a variety of ways. Orthodox sociology, whether functionalist or Marxist structuralist on the other hand, takes as its point of departure society as a whole and only rarely attempts to explain in detail the exact historical processes through which collective social institutions have emerged out of the interactions among individuals. More importantly, it denies these individuals their own ontological status, viewing them as constituted by the totality within which they are inscribed. We've all heard, particularly people on the left, that that, that in fact individuals don't exist. They are the product of the bourgeois ideology of the individual. Probably, and I'm not sure if you are too young to have heard this myth, but uh, there still goes around, and it's the idea that in fact what truly exists is the system. Every, every other part is constituted by being part of the system. Therefore, if viewing ourselves as individuals is in fact a mirage, which, which uh, Marx explained by the fact that it was, you know, one of these components of this totality was this ideology that permeates everything somehow magically. And that ideology made us believe that, in fact, we do exist as, as, as individuals. I don't have to add that, of course, that particular theory was used many times to justify forced uh, uh, collectivization because precisely if we are not really, really individuals, then who cares? You know, you can just force collectivization on them, uh, given that, in fact, their individuality does not exist. Fortunately, the last few decades, so in other words, what I just read means we cannot really count on microeconomics or sociology to help us here. Fortunately, the last few decades have witnessed the birth and growth of a synthesis of economic and sociological ideas going under the banner of neo-institutional economics, as exemplified by the work of authors like Douglas North, Victor Vanberg, Oliver Williamson, and so on. This new school, or set of schools, rejects the atomism of neoclassical economics, as well as the holism of structuralist and functionalist sociologists. It preserves what is called methodological individualism, that is to begin with individual decision makers, as it should be in a bottom-up perspective, but rejects the idea that individuals make decisions following their own internal maximizing calculations. When was the last time that you actually ran through your preferences when you bought something? Uh, and instead models them, as, and, and in any case, it has been shown several times through computer simulations that 
our minds simply cannot optimize in that sense. We simply do not have the computational resources to optimize in every case. We are much more, at this, as decision makers do, and in, we do in fact have a certain rationality, but it's not an optimizing rationality, it's a satisfying ra rationality. We, set up, we, we settle for compromises, particularly because most of the problems we encounter in real life have cons conflicting constraints, and we can never find like the best or the fittest solution to a particular problem. So, so in, in our computer bottom-up simulations, a, a, a decision makers should rather be modeled differently, not only interacting, but also following rules that are in many cases collective. For instance, rules of thumb as to how to do things that you might have picked up from other individuals. On the other hand, neo-institutionalism rejects the methodological holism of society that is beginning at the top, that is, in other words, assuming the holes simply exist, but it preserves what we might call its ontological holism. That is, the idea that even though collective institutions emerge out of the interactions between individuals, once they have formed, these institutions have a life of their own. That is, they are not just reified entities, uh, but are capable of affecting individual decision making in many different ways. Let's just go back to the, to the uh, example of the stock ex exchange in Venice. Before the stock exchange actually came into being as a full institution with its own charter and its own formal rules, the informal rules that guided the interactions between, in, between the merchants could in, had certain flexibility, could be modified. But once the institution comes into being, particularly once it acquires its own building and its own charter, its own definition, it becomes an entity on its own. As long as that individual is run by the book and the majority of bureaucrats and the majority of managers and so on in the world run things by the book, the institution has a life of its own. On the other hand, there can clearly be feedback loops and circuits in, and certain short circuits in this, in this multi-level ontology because particularly ruthless individuals, for instance, can take over an institution. That's the way Stalin, for instance, took over his own communist party. Particularly charismatic individuals, too, can indeed a, a, a lead an institution and, and imprint a certain, and, and give it a certain personal style. But in general and statistically, the majority of institutions which are run by the book have simply a life of their own. And they constrain by the rules and the regulations and the very buildings where they, where they uh, uh, exist, the behavior of individual decision makers without, without superseding them. In other words, History continues at the individual decision makers. Only now it has been added another level in which now institutions begin interacting with each other. Now, one difference between the neo-institutionalist approach and the one I'm trying to sketch here is that beyond the level of individual organizations, specific bureaucratic agencies, stock markets, banks, and other financial institutions, and so on, the neo-institutionalist does not seem to envision yet another emergent, larger scale entity, but simply refers to society or the polity as a whole. This, however, runs the risk of introducing too much homogeneity into our models and of suggesting that human societies form a totality that is, an entity on a higher ontological plane than individual institutions and individual human beings. On the contrary, we must carry the same line of thought farther and view interacting institutions as giving rise to yet other emergent structures such as specific urban centers. Including concrete cities in our analysis, instead of referring to society or culture in the abstract, enables us to model historically emergent wholes that do not form totalities but simply larger scale individual entities, the individual city of Los Angeles, the individual city of Venice, and so on. And so in other words, the new ontology includes only individuals, organic, institutional, urban, existing on the same ontological plane, but operating at very different, in very different space and time scales. This is a very important point because the same, it, it is precisely the fact that, that these emergent holes don't occupy a, another level of reality, but are right there with us 
is what, what that makes this feedback and short circuits possible. Not only individual decision makers like Stalin or a very charismatic leader can indeed take over an institution, particularly powerful institutions can take over a city. For instance, General Motors, Ford, and Chrysler basically taking over Detroit or deciding the fate of Detroit. There are many company towns like Stuttgart run, you know, which Mercedes-Benz basically not runs, but in which he has so much influence that indeed it short circuits this, this idea because Mercedes-Benz is an entity at this level and is influencing a larger scale entity. On the other hand, and again statistically, cities are indeed completely separate holes that indeed constrain in a variety of ways what they I call them institutional ecologies, you know, this, this heterogeneous combinations of, uh, of organizations like hospitals, schools, prisons, barracks, factories, uh, bureaucracies, uh, churches, and so on that inhabit cities. These institutional ecologies, complex and heterogeneous, are indeed constrained in many of the things they do by belonging to a larger whole, which is the city even though this short circuits can occur. But at any rate, they are all occupying this flat ontology. They are not levels of a hierarchy of, of uh, you know, ontological hierarchy. They are just individuals that simply happen to be operating at larger space and time scales. The stock market of Venice as a building is larger in space than we are as individual bodies and is larger in time. It still exists and so many generations of human beings have come and gone and the stock market of Venice is still there. Cities are the same, they many times outlive the institutions that gave rise to it. Corporations come and go and yet certain cities are still there. Now. Let me just, kind of, I lost my place here. Although Brodel does not explicitly refer to this, to this uh, ontological matters, it is clear that his conception of history as comprising several temporal scales of different duration must be given some physical underpinning beyond the mere existence of economic cycles of different lengths. A flattened ontology made up of emergent individual holes, each operating on different scales, would provide such a basis. An ontology of differently scaled individuals also reduces the danger of taking too much social uniformity for granted, a charge often made against functionalist versions of sociology. Individual cities and nation states are easier to visualize as encompassing a variety of communities within their borders and I mean, are much easier to visualize as, as made out of a heterogeneous population than when we talk about society, like for instance, Western culture. Just what is Western culture? Is it French culture? Is it German culture? Is it British culture? Or are we, are we assuming that there's an essence to each one of these cultures that is the same and therefore we can talk about Western culture? The fact of the matter is that Western culture, simply the term, lies to us. It, it implies that there is this homogenous entity out there called Western culture, which in fact does not exist. In some cases, there is homogeneity, I mean, as I'm gonna say in a second, but that homogeneity needs to be given a particular explanation. Let me just give you an example right now. Uh, and, and I'm gonna be saying things that I'm probably gonna be reading in a second, but it's important at this point in the conversation. Uh, one of the, the, the divisions that Brodel makes is between cities that are landlocked capitals, Paris, Vienna, Madrid, Mexico City, and cities that are gateways, maritime gateways, such as Venice, Amsterdam, Lisbon, uh, New York City today, London for a long time. The difference is that gateways, for instance Venice, are are open to the outside to heterogeneous influences precisely because they're mercantile, sea-based uh, 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 cities. And, and for instance, many of the things that allow the West to eventually conquer the millennium, like the compass, paper money, gunpowder, uh, all the accounting methods that had been developed in Islam and so on, entered through Venice. Because Venice was pretty much like New York is today, a mosaic of different cultures with very little 
will or power to create a homogenous Venetian overall culture. When you see, for instance, the Venetian Gothic architectural style, it looks totally oriental. I mean, it has very little to do with, say, Paris's own Gothic style. Uh, on the other hand, landlocked capitals, precisely by being the top of a hierarchy of towns, create a situation where there is this brain drain from the provinces with all this in smart people from the provinces migrating up the hierarchy to the larger towns, then to the next larger, then to eventually ending up in the capital. It's a situation which over many centuries does produce, as a, as a, as a specific historical process, a more or less homogenous synthesis of, of all the different cultural in, elements from the different uh, regions of France. And then it's a culture that once synthesized in the capital can get exported again to, to the rest of the territories, giving the impression that there is this thing called French culture with an essence of French culturalness which in fact is not true. Even in cases like France, who have had the historical time and opportunity to create a homogenous culture, you still find minorities, uh, uh, Provençal mi minorities or Norman minorities and so on, which not only have stuck to their own dialects and languages, as opposed to par adopting the Parisian French, but have stuck to their own habits and all cultural inheritances. Uh, therefore, in order to capture real history in its full heterogeneity, in its full variety, we need to begin by eliminating totalities, because totalities, society, French culture, Western culture, particularly the larger ones, uh, simply inject into the analysis this artificial homogeneity that is not there. An ontology of different scaled individuals reduces the danger of taking too much social uniformity for granted. And if, as a matter of empirical fact, a given city or nation state displays a high degree of cultural homogeneity, this itself becomes something to be modeled as a result of concrete historical processes that is something in need of philosophical explanation, not something to be taken for granted as a point of departure for analysis. Uh, and I'm going to repeat the example I just give, gave. A landlocked city may play the role of political capital for a given region and encourage a certain degree of uniformity in its own culture and that of the hierarchy of smaller towns under its command. Here one could mention Paris, Vienna, or Madrid as examples. All three landlocked capital, which over time synthesized a more or less homogeneous culture, which was later exported to smaller provincial towns. On the contrary, a city may act as a gateway to foreign cultures, as was the case of many maritime metropolis in the past, forming not hierarchies but networks with other such gateways, gateways and promoting the entry and diffusion of heterogeneous materials that increase its diversity and that of the cities in close contact with it. We would not expect the same degree of cultural uniformity in these networks of gateways than in the hierarchies of towns just mentioned, hierarchies, hierarchies which, by the way, played a pivotal role in organizing the territories which would later, later become nation states. In other words, we're not going to take for granted cities, we cannot take for granted nation states either. Something had to organize the space where nation states gelled. And when you look at European history, those places which had the strongest city-states, that is, that had the strongest self-autonomous and independent cities, where the, like Italy and Germany, were the places where national unification came last, while those places dominated by, by their own hierarchies of towns, which had pre-organized the very space where the nation-state would gel or would crystallize, where precisely where nation states were capable of becoming entities with their own consistency and their own duration. But again, all of this is bottom up. We are, we are, even though we are ending up with similar entities as the sociologists and the economists, we're doing it bottom up so that we, in fact, we're not introducing essences or we're not introducing totalities through the back door in our analysis. A similar point that at a different scale applies to the populations of individual institutions that inhabit a given city. 
This population should be modeled not as forming simple homogeneous systems, but complex heterogeneous ecologies, unless, as before, one can specify a, a particular historical process to account for a high degree of uniformity. Those indeed do exist, but they need to be detailed. It is at this level of scale that Brodell makes one of his most surprising assertions, that is at the level of scale of institutions. We have become accustomed to view economic institutions as forming a simple totality, either a free market, if you are on the right or the center, or a capitalist system, if you are on the center left and the left. But Brodell has shown just how mistaken this can be. And, and let me just add, before someone throws tomatoes at me, that I'm not, when one denies that, the capital, that there's such a thing as the capitalist system, it's not to deny that there is such a thing as economic power, or that there has been economic exploitation in the past, or that in fact large multinational corporations exist today and dominate large portions of the world. It's simply to say that the, that the concept capitalist system is inadequate to explain the dynamics the economic dynamics that, that behind exploitation and, 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 and world domination. So I'm quoting Brodell now. He says, we should not be too quick to assume that capitalism embraces the whole of Western society, that it accounts for every stitch in the social fabric, that our societies are organized from top to bottom in a capitalist system. On the contrary, there's a dialectic that's still very much alive between capitalism on one hand and its antithesis, the non-capitalism of the lower level of the market. So now he's contrasting, you know, typically we tend to think of capitalism as the market. And he's saying, no, sir, it's totally two different things. He, con he continues, this lower level is identified with individual markets, which, and indeed, he claims that capitalism was carried upward and onward on the shoulders of small shops, and the, I quote again, the enormous creative powers of the market, of the lower story of exchange. This lowest level, not being paralyzed by the size of its plant or organization, is the one readiest to adapt. It is the seedbed of inspiration, improvisation, and even innovation although its most brilliant discoveries sooner or later fall into the hands of the holders of capital. It was not the capitalists who brought about the first cotton revolution. All the new ideas came from enterprising small businesses. Now I'm going to do this in detail, but just to again summarize in advance what I'm gonna say. The idea here then is that the economy forms a much more heterogeneous thing than we thought it was. Basically, what Brodell is doing is that if you go all the way back to the 13th and 14th centuries, there's already a big difference between big business on one hand and small businesses on the other. A completely different dynamic in wholesale than in retail. A completely different dynamic in large financial institutions like the very large banks that Florence already had in the 15th century and small money lenders. There's just no comparison between the two. So to call them both capitalist, or call them both part of the capitalist system, is to simply impose a uniformity that is not there, and as we will see in a second, to close the doors to the opportunities that we do in fact have to break the, the, the stranglehold that large businesses, that large corporations have right now on the world. Several things follow from Brodell's distinction between market and capitalist institutions. He, in fact, calls capitalist institutions, wholesalers, uh, large businesses, uh, joint stock corporations, and so on, he calls them anti-markets, to, not to just to be polemical, but to, not, and, and to mark the difference between big and small, but to say, only when you have a large number of small businesses do you have the kind of dynamics that is where, where supply and demand are, display a certain amount of self-regulation? In other words, only when, you, when, when there is no economic power, but everybody is participating in, a, in demand and supply at the same level, do you have any kind of invisible hand, any kind of self-regulation, any of those things that defenders of the free market against government regulation always uses arguments. But when you have three, 
entities like Ford, General Motors, and Chrysler, she do not have self-regulation by a long shot. In fact, the mathematics used to model the interactions between these three entities come from game theory, which is the same mathematical uh, models that are used to, to, to uh, model, a, uh, for instance, arms races between uh, nation states or rivalries between military establishments. In other words, it is the kind of math that applies to large bureaucratic hierarchical organizations where there is no self-regulation whatsoever. Another way of putting this is that Small businesses have always been price takers, precisely because demand and supply do play a more or less anonymous role there. When there's enough numbers, prices set themselves. And that is what we call self-regulation. But when you have General Motors, Chrysler, and, 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 and uh, whatever, when you have an oligopoly, a, a situation with three or four or five big players, they set their own prices. Oligopolies are price setters. They have never, ever been price takers. And therefore, they are not, they do not display any kind of self-regulation. Now, several things follow from this distinction between markets and anti-markets. If markets and anti-markets have never been the same thing, then both those who believe in the angelical magic of the invisible hand as well as those who demonize market transactions as involving a commodification are both wrong. The former because spontaneous coordination by an invisible hand does not apply to big business, and the latter because commodity fetishism does not apply to the products created by small businesses, but only to large hierarchical organizations capable of manipulating demand to create artificial needs. In other words, for people on the right and center of the political spectrum, all monetary transactions, even if they involve large oligopolies or even monopolies, are considered market transactions. For the Marxist left, on the other hand, the very presence of money, regardless of whether it involves economic power or not, means that a social transaction has now been commodified and hence made part of cap capitalism. It is my belief that Brodel's empirical data forces on us to make a distinction which is not made by the left or the right, that between market and anti-market institutions, and hence to view the institutional ecologies which inhabit urban centers, even within the restricted world of economics, as more heterogeneous than we have so far allowed. I'm going to give some examples of this in a second. It is important to mention that the distinction between markets and anti-markets is a matter of scale like the difference between retail and wholesale, since it is large scale that allows certain institutions to manipulate demand and supply, hence the name anti-market, because they are manipulating demand and supply. Moreover, a similar distinction applies when one, when one views economics from the point of view not of trade, but of production. Let me illustrate this point by contrasting two types of wealth generating economic processes, one of which depends on homogenization for its efficiency, while the other relies on an articulation of heterogeneities from which it derives network externalities. The first one is the most familiar one, and we commonly refer to it, to it as economies of scale. Here the basic principle is the production of large runs of more or less homogeneous products, the cost of each replica decreasing as the scale of the production increases. By standardizing production, costs can be spread across a large number of identical units, and in this way the law of diminishing returns can be overcome. Yet historically, okay, let me just pause here for a second and, and make a, a comment here. First of all, let me just give the relevance of this to architecture. Several of my, you know, I teach arch uh, to architecture students at Columbia and many of them uh, ask me, well, how can I, uh, part, you know, part as a designer, as a creator, how can I escape this commodification process that it is what capitalism is? And I tell them, well, that first of all, if you think that way, you're already not going to escape this thing because you're already closing yourself up into this world which you're imagining exists out there in which, in which the capitalist system manipulates every single little thing about society. The important thing here is to start thinking in, in again, 
including all the different heterogeneous actors in, in the economy, and begin to think that economies of scale, that is, the economies that depend on homogenization, that don't depend on creativity, but that depend on rather routinization of production and the creation of large runs of identically, identical products, is one thing. And that there is that there have always been, all the way back to the 14th and 15th centuries, networks of small businesses which compete against each other. They are markets, they are in fact competing, but they don't compete against each other in terms of costs. Because if you compete in terms of costs, immediately large size is your best bet. But compete against each other in terms of design. Is, well, again, it can be any kind of product design, and I'm going to give some examples in a second. But perhaps the most famous example in the United States has been, is, is a study that has been recently been made that compares Silicon Valley to a particular part of Boston called the Route 128 in Boston, two areas of the United States where computers are created, but one dominated by networks of small businesses. I mean, Silicon Valley clearly has huge multinational corporations like Intel, Xerox, Cisco, and so on. But the, the substance, the main substance of Silicon Valley is small businesses, which you probably would never even have heard about it because they are so small. They manufacture parts of hard drives. They do the right software. They manufacture, they put together different, uh, you know, uh, uh, parts for computers and so on, or invent new uh, uh, plugins for, uh, for software and, and, and so on. That particular uh, uh, cottage industry was indeed started at least in part by the creation of the Apple, which again is a creation by entrepreneurs, not managers of corporations, when they came up with the idea of an open architecture. That is the Apple II, I don't know if you remember it, this is because before the Macintosh, was the first one who came up with the idea of selling you an abstract computer, so to speak, a computer with a, with a set of empty slots so that you could, if you were a musician, buy a card that was a music synthesizer, but if you were a 3D CAD designer, you could buy a, a, a math accelerator board that would give your 3D a little more of a real time, or if you, and, and so on. And of course, if you're gonna have empty slots, you need to give the specifications away. And what they did by doing that is create a cottage industry of people that could create boards for the, for the Apple II. When IBM finally came out with its own personal computer, even though IBM had exactly the opposite philosophy, they would sell you the mainframe with a maintenance contract, and if you dare to open it, let alone put someone else's boards inside, they would cancel your, your, uh, your uh, service contract, and IBM came up forced by this new paradigm with the IBM PC, which also had empty slots, and you also had to give the specifications of the bus, as it's called, the way of transmitting signals between the boards and the main computer. So there's a, a reason. This, this economies, this network economies, made out of many different businesses doing, competing against each other in terms of creativity, are called economies of agglomeration, to oppose them to economies of scale. One then is based on homogenization, in the sense that you have to routinize production, take all the flexible skills out of the workers and make them just follow definite routines, make the machines pace and discipline the human, and basically create copies in as many, as, as large numbers as possible. And yes, it does generate efficiencies. That's why the Industrial Revolution paradigm imposed itself, because it generates wealth. But it is not the only way of generating wealth. You can also generate wealth with economies of agglomeration. Let me quote from some historians that have studied this process in detail that are Brodellian in inspiration. Economies of agglomeration come from the fact that a firm can find, oh, by the way, and, and, and economies of agglomeration in the past, I just quoted Silicon Graph, I mean, I just gave you as an example, Silicon Valley and Route 128, which are uh, industrial hinterlands, so to speak, attached to a particular city, you know, San Francisco, Boston, and attached to specific universities, Stanford, MIT. But in the past, it was large cities 
that were the main seat of economies of agglomeration because their high rents did not allow large factories to settle there. In, 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 in England, for instance, the Industrial Revolution did not happen in London, happened in, around Manchester and Liverpool and all the new industrial towns that were being born at the time. London, on the other hand, was the seat of economies of agglomeration. So economies of agglomeration come from the fact that the firm can find in a large city all manner of clients, services, suppliers, and employees, no matter how specialized its product. This in turn promotes increased specialization. Surprisingly, however, economies of agglomeration encourage firm, firms of the same line to locate close to one another, which is why names such as Harley Fleet, Lombard Streets, and Seville Row, to stick to London, call to mind professions rather than place. Besides the non-negligible profit and pleasure of shop talk, all can share access to services that none can support alone. A key point about economies of agglomeration, in other words, you can why are tailors moving on this, moving in the same street? You know, aren't, isn't that going to create more competition? Shouldn't they be like distributed around the city so that each could have its own market share, so to speak? Well, the reason why they happen to be there is among other things that they can now, a lawyer can move in, an accountant can move in, that can now service them all. But also, and this is the important thing, they can exchange knowledge. They can exchange knowledge in the form of shop talk, in the form of employees that, that move from one place to another. This one was a very interesting way in which when they were comparing Route 128 and Silicon Valley, one of the things was the, the turnover rate. In Silicon, in, in Route 128, dominated by firms like DEC or Digital, if you have not heard of them, I don't blame you. They are dinosaurs that are on their, on their way to disappearing. But they were, for a while, the competitors of IBM. I mean, they invented the mini computer, and for a while they, they were thought to be, you know, the future. But they, were, they were, of course, self-contained, huge corporations in which knowledge is used, but only the knowledge that comes from an R&D laboratory that's part of the large corporation. And when they tackle the personal computer, they try to come up with everything themselves and lost the race against Apple, at least at the beginning. I mean, of course, now we know that Microsoft eventually dominated this with economies of scale, too. But at the beginning, what was important was precisely that Apple was able to profit from the creativity of a large number of people that, were this, that, that they did not know. They, instead of trying to rip off the profits and, and, and kind of control all the profits themselves, they allowed a lot of small businesses to also rip, rip, uh, profits, writing plugins for software and so on, and that the development time was much less. Plus, another thing is that in Silicon Valley, the turnover, the amount of time a, a typical engineer spends in one of these small firms is about three years, which means that there's a continuous migration of, of, of of, of a, a knowledge workers from one firm to another throughout the region, which disperses this knowledge, particularly when it's at the level of know-how, when the knowledge is so avant-garde that it hasn't made it into, a, hasn't become codified, hasn't made it into books, it's still embodied in the, in the hands and brain of the, of the specific individuals involved. And this constant migration of engineers, which disperses knowledge through the region, enriching the region, with, with know-how and knowledge is, what, is one of the reasons why economies of agglomeration are so weedy, so resilient, so robust. They're hard to kill. Whereas the, the self-contained corporations of uh, uh, the Route 128, you know, engineers there tended to spend their entire lives within a corporation, to live, breathe, and eat corporate culture every day. And, and, and the creativity of the region was proportionally less. Now the key to economies of agglomeration is that networks of small producers are the site of the, for the constant exchange of knowledge. Whether we're considering informal know-how or formal knowledge, small-scale industry has traditionally used information as one of its main inputs with increasing regularity. And large, diversified cities were centers where information accumulated and multiplied. Innovations to which Oh, I'm sorry. The innovations to which these economies of agglomeration led made these cities pioneers in many new industrial products and processes, which would later be exported to the centers of heavy industry once they had been routinized. 
for instance, the, all the ideas about building uh, uh, architectural structures with, uh, uh, with a steel frame, in other words, to make walls not load-bearing structures, but make the actual metallic endoskeleton, so to speak, the load-bearing structure, therefore able to do glass walls and things like that, <coughs> were born in London and Paris in the 19th century. In the context of these economies of agglomeration, and then later exported to centers of heavy industry once they had become so familiar, so not avant garde, that they could become routinized. Here I quote these two urban historians again. They say, The nature of information as an input to production is that it ceases to be important once a given process becomes routine. At that point, other costs for machines, basic labor, and space take over and central cities are at a serious disadvantage. Moreover, economies of scale become critical, and very large cities are not specially favored locations for the largest enterprises." End of quote. Today, the clearest examples of economies of agglomeration come not from large cities, but from industrial hinterlands, from the industrial hinterlands these cities animate at a distance. I already gave you the example of Silicon Valley and Route 128. A better example, and this is a quite a pretty amazing example. Let me just actually just get my notes here so that I can give you the data. Um, here. It's a region of Italy. It's, an, it's a, of northern Italy. The, the region is called Emilia Romagna. Among the famous cities are Bologna, which you probably heard of, but many others, because it's precisely not a tourist center, many others you probably haven't heard of, like Modena. The entire region has an old leftist tradition, but that, a Marxist tradition, but that it, it will, as I, as I will mention in a second, it did have something to do because it, it, it allowed people to trust each other a little bit more due to this shared cultural uh, background. But what basically these people did beginning in the late 50s was to create, and, and it continues today, has been studied by economists from MIT who go there and, and analyze this freak of nature, ha to create a, a true alternative to corporate capitalism. This is a region dominated by small businesses, thousands of small ones. Just to give you some data from the from the 80s. In Modena, its main center, they had 22,000 firms, 90% less than 100 employees. Now, but the key thing here, though, besides size, I mean, these are small size firms, but don't make any mistake. They're totally high tech. They use computers, CAD, design, and, and, and so on. But the most important thing is that they, through a variety of institutions, this is where the institutions need to come in, like trade associations, universities, even the unions played a role, they created a, a social contract for the whole region in which they committed themselves to compete, not to compete against each other, they do compete, it's a market, it's not socialism, compete against each other not on the basis of costs, but on the basis of design. The main products here are graphic design, such as uh, ceramics and textiles, but they do a lot of uh, 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 industrial design too. They build and, and design their own machines. Uh, and they realize that large scale goes against creativity. Large scale calls for routinization. Large scale comes from a certain homogeneity. I'm just to give you another example before I continue with the third Italy. When Apple, which was started, of course, by two hippies, with $1,300 in a garage, two hippies, which by the way were not at all corporate, they used to sell blue boxes, those illegal instruments to make long distance calls uh, uh, that AT&T then unleashed all these detectives to try to catch people like uh, Steve Wozniak and Steve Jobs. Um, and so they were exa not exactly your corporate types at all. Eventually Apple though grew into a large enough entity and at that point they kick out Steve Jobs and bring in to run it a manager from Pepsi Cola. Now the, this is very crucial. If you are if you are right now at that level, everything has become so homogenized that if you are a man, you know you are a CEO that knows how to sell sodas, you're supposed to be good enough to sell computers. It really does not matter. It's one thing or the other. So to use the very idea that a, that an innovative company that needed 
ideas, design, uh, creativity, you, that you could kick out the entrepreneur, the person with, whose vision had formed the company, and bring in a manager from elsewhere. It could have been Campbell's Soup. It could have been Toothpaste. It happened to be Pepsi Cola. And just replace them. Goes to show you the mentality and the homogeneity and routinization that is essential to economies of scale. That's the way they think. In the third Italy, they realized this a long time ago, somewhere sometime during the 60s, and they decided to establish a social contract enforced through certain institutions to ensure that they were never going to grow past a certain size. When the companies grow past a certain size, instead of continuing to grow, they simply split and specialize and therefore now become two companies of the same basic small size. Now this has many consequences, for instance, for workers, since a motivated worker can indeed become an owner in a much easier way than in a world of corporations. In a world of corporations, the main barrier for social mobility of that type is the, the startup costs. If you're gonna have a huge machine and you're gonna need a huge plant and a huge factory, no one can really come in and start a comp a, 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 you know, to compete against you. But if you are a small business with less than 100 employees and a minimal amount of investment is needed in order to get started, a motivated creative worker can in fact cross the social barrier and become an owner. In other words, even though Emilia Romana does not eliminate social classes, there are still bosses and there are still workers, the barrier between the two has become much more permeable much more porous. There's much more mobility between the two, and that, to me, is the best we can hope for, because we already saw what happened when you try to eliminate social classes by command from the top, by taking over the government and simply declaring that social classes won't exist anymore. All you do is create a new class of enforcers of the no-class rule, and, and the, which degenerates immediately into corruption, bureaucracy, and farther and farther hierarchization and homogenization of a society. This happened in just about every socialist country. So here what we have in, 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 in Emilia Romagna is a very good example of what creativity can do for the economy once we begin to understand things bottom up. Because there's just simply no way of going to study Emilia Romana top down and try to figure this out. Well, the Italian society is such that, and then come up with some essence about what Italians are, and then try to explain what Emilia Romana is doing because of this essence of Italianness. You know, as we, as, as we know, the, the reason why Italy became a nation state only at the, at the late in the late 19th century was precisely because of its heterogeneity. So. To try to homogenize it that way would be absurd. On the other hand, the dynamics of Emilia Romana are pretty clear. And the history of it is very clear. I mean, unfortunately, one of the needs, one of the uh, um, things needed in order to make this social contract, this let's compete in terms of creativity, not in terms of costs idea, in order for it to stick, because other people have tried to bootstrap Emilia Romanas in other parts of the world and have not been able to do it, is a certain amount of trust, a certain amount of, uh, you know, because of course they had people, of the small business had to trust one another, otherwise if, if, if one begins to grow and begins to buy smaller companies, that immediately would trigger a, a kind of paranoid reaction among the, the more wealthy of these businesses to try to buy other businesses because if they don't grow like this other one is growing, then they'll probably be left behind or be bought by the big one. And so it's a fragile equilibrium. It's a, self, it's a process of self-organization that could indeed be tipped over into another mode, into another regime, one in which the whole of Emilia Romagna is now dominated by a few large corporations. So something was needed to to kind of allow this trust to uh, allow the kind of the, this grassroots, this weedy system to grow to the point where it's now resilient and robust enough not to have to be bothered by that. And that happened to be the leftist long tradition that Emilia Romana had. Of course, the fact that all these businesses are family businesses and that there is community and, and a certain amount of trust.
uh, it was one of my thoughts that perhaps the internet one day can be used to try to in regions where this trust is not, uh, where this reservoir of trust that is needed for the bootstrapping of the system, when it's not there, the use of the internet, uh, I mean the internet could be used precisely to try to, to allow people to not police one another, but check that everybody is indeed uh, behaving according to the to the contract, to kind of form trust, to form virtual communities in such a way that th this kind of regional economies could now be seeded all over the world and, and for us to try to, um, to, try to uh, promote the, the diffusion and the, the propagation of this, of this uh, paradigm, of this anti-corporate paradigm of, of, of production. Now, the, let me just add one more thing. Moreover, the two paradigms, the corporate and the regional, have different consequences for the future of urban centers. Large corporations, having internalized a variety of functions, you know, whenever a large corporation needs something, it just buys it, makes it part of it, its own, including the research and development laboratory, having, having, hence having become largely self-contained and self-sufficient, have also, for the same reason, acquired geographical mobility. This process has transformed them into potential city killers. When the tax structure of a particular city or region becomes too costly, a corporation can simply move away. And having internalized most of the information and know how it needs to operate, it can take away this reservoir of knowledge. Regional economies, on the other hand, develop knowledge outside the individual firms, spreading it through the constant movement of engineers and designers, and reaching the region which they inhabit, and making it impossible to move it elsewhere. In other words, regional economies feed or nurture cities and, 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 and the industrial hinterlands animated or connected to the cities, precisely because the knowledge now is in the region. Uh, Jane Jacobs, a famous urbanist that I'm sure you, you've heard about, has this very interesting idea as to, you know, to explain how several regions in the world that at, at some point in their histories were third worlds, that is, were supply zones of a, of a, of a, of a region supplying raw materials to, to that particular city in exchange for manufactured products, how it has a very interesting idea how economies of agglomeration helped these cities shed their shackles. She takes several examples. For instance, Venice in the ninth century was basically a, a supply zone, a third world of Constantinople. Venice would sell fish, salt, and timber, raw materials, in exchange for manufactured products, which at the time were combs, brushes, belt buckles, uh, and things like that, nothing too flashy. Uh, London in the 14th century was similarly a, 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 a third world of Italy. It would exchange wool and other uh, uh, raw materials for manufactured products from Italy. Uh, certain cities in the United States before the, the revolution, uh, the, the war of independence, uh, for instance, New York, Boston, and Philadelphia, were supply zones of London for a while until they again shed their shackles. And what Jane, Jack, Jane Jacobs has to say, and in fact she takes most of her data from Brodell, so this is basically still Brodell talking, is that it was a specific, it was a process of enriching a city with knowledge that created this bootstrap, this, this, this uh, possibility for independence and autonomy. The idea is that a supply zone, for as long as it remains sending raw materials to its dominant city, it will remain barren of knowledge. But the moment the locals begin replacing imports, even the most humble impo imports, we're talking about belt buckles, brushes, and things like that, with local production, they begin to develop the know-how and the knowledge to do those products, begin replacing imports, and now, of course, I, I, this process only works with teams of cities because at first the locally produced uh, uh, cheap copies basically of, of the other products cannot be exchanged with the main center, they have to exchange among backward cities. That's why Boston, Philadelphia and, and, uh, and New York form one of these teams of backward cities in the 18th century. And the idea is that 
it, you re begin replacing imports in several rounds. You replace a, a certain amount of inputs with the money that you're saving. Now you buy certain other new, more sophisticated imports, which now become a target for replacement. And the whole idea is that regardless of how humble the products are, they don't have to be steam engines or, or fancy computers. They can be simple things. What matters is the knowledge that's developed in the region, that enriches the region and the networks of small producers, the symbiotic nets, as, as Jane Jacobs calls them, that get developed in a particular place. For instance, Tokyo, according to her, did it with bicycles. They first began, at, towards the end of the 19th century, replacing the fixing of bicycles. They were importing bicycles. They were, began, they were fixing them locally. Then they began manufacturing some of the less complicated parts. Then they began manufacturing uh, some of the more complicated parts and assembling them already locally, even if they had to be importing some of the parts. Finally, they began to replace the entire bicycle with locally manufactured bicycles. Now, the point here is not a that a bicycle is some kind of magic object that takes you out of underdeveloped is that once you have a network of small producers that, manu that knows how to do bicycles, they know how to do sewing machines, they know how to do many other products that involve complex gearing and complex assemblages of parts. And so what's interesting about this is precisely that the role of knowledge and creativity in these other types of wealth generating systems in economies of agglomeration. Let me finish this um, brief analysis of, 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 of the hero her heterogeneity of actual economics by quoting Brodel again, just so that, and, and again, Brodel is, is the main economic historian of the century. I mean, if, if there was a Nobel Prize for history, he would get it, even though he's dead already. Uh, because he, his work is absolutely amazing. So his opinion about this really does matter, particularly his opinion when it comes to the politics of this. So he, I, I quote here, this is the very last sentence of his magnum opus. If we are prepared to make an unequivocal distinction between the market economy and capitalism, that is between markets and anti-markets, between economies of agglomeration and economies of scale, this might might this offer us a way of avoiding that all or nothing which politicians are always putting to us as if it was impossible to retain the market economy without giving the monopolies a free hand, without nationalizing everything in sight? As long as the solutions put forward amount to replacing the monopoly of capital with the monopoly of the state, compounding the faults of the former with those of the latter, it is hardly surprising that the classic left-wing solutions do not arouse great electoral enthusiasm. If people set about looking for the solutions seriously and honestly, economic solutions could be found which would extend the area of the market and would put it at its disposal the economic advantages so far kept to itself by one dominant group of society. Uh, now, this is, these are very strong words. He's, he's basically changing the entire strategy. He's saying, forget about this ridiculous idea of taking over the state. I mean, because you have to remember that when you think in, when particular, I mean, I come from Mexico originally, and so when I grew up, all, you know, young people, we, we were all so proud of Fidel Castro and Che Guevara, you know, because they had taken off from Mexico and then they went on and, and actually won a war against the Cuban government and took over the government. And so everybody was wearing the Che t-shirts and so on. And, but then when you begin reading about it, you know, the, Marxism had offered them the idea that precisely because totalities go through an inevitable process of maturation, of going from feudalism, which is a kind of childhood, to a kind of adolescence of industrial age, to finally mature and become this, uh, this socialist countries with, where their destiny is fulfilled, precisely because they thought it was a matter of destiny. They did not think they were going to need an enormous amount of institutional creativity the moment they took over power. In other words, for this old-fashioned leftist, the hard part was the guerrilla warfare. Once you had access to the government, you could just basically put society in automatic, in automatic pilot, so to speak, and it was just going to find its way to the future. Che Guevara, 
you know, when it was offered the, the, the Minister of Finance, you know, where he would have had to actually try to come up with a new banking system, new ways of, 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 of using money, new creative solutions for how to, how to do, deal with finance, much as, as the people in Emilia Romagna have found. Instead, he thought this was now kind of routine work and went instead to fight another guerrilla in a uh, war in, in Bolivia. But what that shows you is how little idea they had of how complex, how much of a complex process it was to fix society. They thought it was so much easier. Another, another interesting thing about considering history in its full heterogeneity is that Otherwise, we lose sight of the actual historical processes that have created those things that we find most oppressive. And let me just give you one example to, to finish this talk. Many of us think that the routinization and industrial discipline necessary for economies of a scale to work, you know, kind of getting workers to, you know, making workers lose their flexible creative skills, replacing them with routines, and then allowing machines to pace and discipline these workers. Many of us think, particularly when you've read this only through Marx as authors, that this was in fact the invention of the bourgeoisie. But of course, it wasn't. It was invention, the industrial discipline and the routinization of, of, of labor and the entire concept of how to create identical products in, in, in economies of scale was the creation of military arsenals and armories in the 18th century in France. He was a person called Honor Blanc, an armorer, who came up with the idea of, because at the time, weapons were created one at a time, each one by a different artisan. But you can imagine that if you're making rifles, for instance, and I make the entire rifle, and you make this other entire rifle, everyone makes it, every single craftsman makes a different rifle. When you try to replace spare parts into the rifle, they won't fit unless they were manufactured by the same artisan. In other words, supplying a front with spare parts the uniformity and standardization that's needed for that was not possible if you allowed creativity to have free reign in the workshop. So what they did, they, come up, they came up with the idea of one standard rifle and a set of, of gauges and fixtures and measures to check that everybody was producing parts that fit those parts of the standard rifle, long where the days where every artisan manufactured a complete weapon. Now it would, it would be divided, the, the, the labor was going to be divided. And of course they realized right away that in order for, make, to make, for them to make this work, because the workers immediately realized they were losing power the moment they could not exercise their creativity, their skills, was to impose a very harsh military discipline in the workshop. Thomas Jefferson went to France and saw a demonstration of this. He brought it to America. In the American myth, he was, of course, an entrepreneur, Eli Whitney, who actually created this process. But that is, of course, a myth. The reality is that armories and, 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 and uh, arsenals in Northeast, mostly in Connecticut and Massachusetts, were the place where this system was, in fact, developed. Tom, in Fr in France began it, but its true institutionalization and its conversion into something like eventually Henry Ford would adapt for his car factories was done in arsenals and armories because during the 1812 war against England, the United States almost lost the war for lack of spare parts to supply the front. So in a couple of decades, military engineers in these places created this entire system of industrial discipline, of watching people, of routinizing labor, of withdrawing control from the creative hands of, 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 of artisans and putting them in the hands of the engineer. And it was only when this military aspect was combined with the scale that Britain had given its Industrial Revolution that the two things came together in the form of Henry Ford's car factory of the early 20th century and 20th century capitalism finally took off based on this paradigm. But again, unless we allow in our, the institutional ecologies that inhabit cities 
So unless we allow this heterogeneity so that we see that in fact arsenals coexist with economic institutions and so on, and if we tend to, th to think of it in terms of the, the capitalist system as a homogenous thing, we immediately lose sight of the actual origin of one of the most oppressive aspects of this particular paradigm. We lose sight of, of a fact that Michel Foucault, of course, has never lost sight of, of the fact that discipline is a very specific form of power that works by withdrawing knowledge from the workers. Know-how, in this case, skilled know-how. And therefore, once you lose sight of where it came from and what its original intentions were, you lose sight as to how to change it. To me, one of the most telling facts about this is that Lenin, who was otherwise a very, very smart person, welcomed Taylorism, remember Taylorism, the routinization of labor done by, by Frederick Taylor towards the end of the 19th century, learned in arsenals and armories. Uh, he welcomed Taylorism as the only good thing that capitalism had created. In other words, to him, all you had to do is eliminate private property, this commoditization of, 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 of you know, done by money, but the routinization of, the la of labor, which was, of course, the most uh, uh, obvious effect of power was welcomed as if it was no problem, as if it was indeed an advance. For many years indeed, Taylorism, this routinization, this homogenization, was called scientific management by people both in socialist and in capitalist countries, which goes to show you that we had absolutely no idea how barbaric, in fact, it is, how, how backward this mentality is. Today, places like Emilia Romana and Silicon Valley are beginning to show us what is possible when you allow allow heterogeneity and diversity to operate. It is indeed as if we were confronted with two very different architectures, when you take architecture in its most wide, in its, its wider sense, where it's not just specific load-bearing structures, but where you think of the architecture of the human body or the architecture of a computer, you know, when they talk about serial and parallel architectures. Architecture in this more general sense show us that there are at least two very different ones, two very different models. One in which a new structure is put together by articulating homogenous elements, such as the ranks of a hierarchy, of a military hierarchy, and a completely different one which is made, created when you put together the diverse as such. Deleuze and Gattari call them trees and rhizomes. They also call them strata and self organized or self-consistent aggregates. They have a variety of terms for this. And, but it is amazing to me that we had to wait until the 80s, until we began to realize that in fact, we had all these different types of architectures out there. It's to me amazing that we continue to think that the only type was homogenous, hierarchical, centralized, and that we kept forgetting that indeed we can have non-hierarchical, network-based, decentral, based on this decentralized decision-making and based on creativity, not costs, not routinization. But today at least we're beginning to have the rudiments of a theory to think about these two completely different types of architecture and their mixtures. And we begin to have historical analysis of specific places where we can, we can see the network model succeeding. The network model showing that creativity can be made the core or the center of an economy and indeed infuse a particular region with, with vitality, much as we can see in Emilia Romagna. Thank you very much. I, uh, if there are some questions, I'll be very happy to answer them. Well, while you make up your minds, let me add one more thing that's very important. Uh, a, a very important thing here, I mean, I just talked about two different architectures, is not to begin idealizing one and demonizing the other. In other words, it's very important not to now tell, the, say, the history of, of, of Western economics or the history of, West, of the West in general 
using rhizomes as heroes and hierarchies or centralized structures as villains. Because in fact, the most important thing here is going to be an experimental attitude towards the different hybrids that the two can have. For instance, just to give you a very good ex the example of Emilia Romagna, again, even though they were a rhizome for a long time and a quite an impressive one at that, they realized that unless they protected themselves in certain ways, corporations could indeed take over the region. And so what they did is, again, in meetings and through trade associations and through a variety of institutions, they, they found those areas of the economy where economies of scale and hierarchy are inevitable, or at least very, very hard to avoid. And those three were uh, logistics, everything having to do with inventory control, with uh, accounting and so on. Finances, because banks don't know how to lend to small businesses, particularly small businesses competing in terms of design. And marketing, because, you know, in order to market things worldwide, small businesses simply do not have the resources. So they decided to create these three very hierarchical, very old-fashioned, very oppressive called things called consortia, three, one consortium for finances, which is their interface to the, to the banking world, a consortium for logistics, and a consortium for marketing, which meant that they lost their right to market their wares under their own brand, but they kept the right to do their own design. And to them, that is all that matter. Say, so screw the brand. You can brand this anything you want to. As long as I can, in fact, continue designing and making all the decisions needed, all the creative decisions for a design, who cares what brand this gets marketed with? But, and of course, these three consortia are owned by the little guys, so they do not exercise power over them. But what I think is very interesting is that the case of Emilia Romagna avoids this kind of romanticization of the rhizome, this romanticization of the network, as if a network by itself was, was enough to save us, when in fact what we need is precisely to acknowledge and be humble about our ignorance about our past, about the fact that these new multi-layer historical models are beginning only to, to come up and so we, we need to come to grips with them, and therefore that our ignorance demands that we be more experimental and open about how to combine hybrids of the centralized and the decentralized, so these two different architectures uh, that I was talking about. Okay. How would you apply your uh, analysis to Well, I don't, I don't have any specific examples to give you that, that are very convincing. Clearly, yeah, clearly, I mean, I, I, I have several, I have data about, uh, for instance, uh, there's a historian of science. This doesn't apply directly to architecture, but does apply to institutional ecologists, including universities. There's a historian of science who, uh, who tr was trying to decipher why France, uh, towards, the end, towards the beginning of the 19th century, lost its lead. You know, France was the center of science for a long time. Lavoisier and, and Carnot and so on, all the main scientists were French, lost its lead to Germany towards the middle of the 19th century. And uh, there was really nothing specifically French about it, or specifically German. And what turned out to be was that the, un the French university system, the Polytechnique, and all that, the, a variety of other, uh, the, 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 their educational system has had been invented during the revolution and during the Napoleonic eras, was much too centralized. And that the German, this is of course we're talking now about relations between universities as opposed to you, the case you mentioned I suppose was moving, zooming in a little bit more to be within a particular university, but it sort of answers this question a little bit. The German university system on the other hand happened for contingent reasons to be very decentralized. 
in that period. And that created a dynamic of knowledge where not only could scholars move much easier from one place to another, but so that it was so much easier to create new departments within universities and therefore a, a not a, a catch up with what was happening in science. For instance, there were of course the, the, the chairs for chemistry and then the chairs for physics. But if you're in those, your educational department did not allow to very easily to create a department of physical chemistry, all these new fields that were beginning to come into being at the inter, uh, at the at the interface between fields like biophysics or biochemistry or physical chemistry. If you did not allow, if your system did not allow for the fast creation of new departments so that you could in fact accommodate this specialization and diversification of science, you were left behind. And one of the one of the studies uh, uh, that, that this guy makes is precisely on how German universities, which eventually, by the way, influenced how the American university system was put together because it was many American students, particularly of physics and science, going to Germany that came back at the beginning of the 20th century with the idea of how to run departments in a slightly more decentralized way. So that's, I mean, that is one example that's very well documented as to how a rhizome of universities, in this case, was much more capable of keeping up with the advance of science, with the advance of knowledge itself, by allowing itself to differentiate easier, to keep up, right? On the other hand, when you're talking about what happens within a particular department, we've seen many failures. You know, of course, the 60s were a very anti-authoritarian decade, and we thought back then that you could simply replace uh, hierarchies and, hier and centralized system with a kind of wishful thinking for decentralization. In other words, it was simply enough to now say no to authority, and then and then the rhizome would form. And so, what made for a failure of a lot of these decentralized educational programs was precisely a lack of sense of the difficulty of putting rhizomes together, of putting networks together, of, of bootstrapping these things. I mean, that's, one of, one of, that's why one of, the, one of the points that I stressed in my talk today was precisely that how hard it is to create Emilia Romana somewhere else. People from New York have gone to Emilia Romana, and New York used to be in the 1930s and 40s, uh, a very complex economy of small businesses with tons of printers, bakers, uh, uh, designers, and so on, and today is dead. I mean, today artists are moving into the skeleton of what used to be the industrial structure in Soho, for instance, right? I mean, you have all these old industrial spaces where now artists are moving in, uh, and, but artists that are not producing anything, at least not anything economic. And so New York is dead economically. I mean, it still has this large banking and, and financial centers, but it is not a self-sufficient city at all. When it used to be in the 30s and 40s. So people that have gone to Emilia Romano to try to revive New York, because we still have this industrial hinterlands just outside of Manhattan that, that could be revived even if, if it was just about, you know, with creating software, creating video games, or some new product, and how, and how, how hard it is to bootstrap a rhizome. So I think one of the problems with the anti-authoritarianism of the 60s was that, that we thought that it was easy to simply replace a centralized scheme with a decentralized one. And we did not realize how much experimentation and failure and learning from doing it was going to take to come up with these hybrids and to and to be able to assess what this uh, hybrids. Are. As I said, unfortunately, I don't have any concrete examples. I mean, I know that SciArc is precisely an example of an experimental place where where some of those barriers are being brought down, and uh, and it's a very successful place since it has not collapsed like many of those older experiments have in the past. But unfortunately, I don't have enough data about its history and about its the details, and of course all this depends on the details, because we're talking about very concrete experiments, right? But again, one of the things is, one of the problems was our over-enthusiasm with revolution and with easy solutions. We, we tended to believe, and this is again the Che Guevara example, that all that was matter was that we made up our minds 
about a certain thing and then the rest followed. And we failed to take into account this complex history of individuals, institutions, cities and so on in which all of the levels influence one another, constrain one another in a variety of ways. And, and we have not come to grips with that complexity and that heterogeneity and that is one of the things that we need to in order to be able to be able to create these new places of teaching and these new places of production for the 21st century. I saw another hand. Yeah, Bo, yeah. Um, I'm a big fan of the power of the entrepreneur and uh, the power of uh, heterogeneous interaction and uh, flux and so forth. Um, yet it seems very dangerous um, within our current economy now, um, Silicon Valley and entrepreneurialism, that its real true value is being scripted by a very hierarchical institution of, of, of Wall Street, for instance, which is um, overvaluated. You mean like Yahoo stock and Amazon Comstock going right in the bubble, you mean the kind of internet bubble? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, that is, I mean, one of the reasons why socialism never quite worked is because they failed to take into account that once you create the system, it was going to begin coexisting with all the bad guys immediately. And that, you know, that you were, if you did not take into account all those effects, I mean, that's why I mentioned right now Emilia Romana's three consortia as a kind of protection belt that they built for themselves. You know, because, you know, it, it, to me it's so great that they didn't think, oh, well, we are a rhizome now, we are very Delusian, and so let's stay a pure rhizome. And, and that they actually bit the bullet and said, we need a certain amount of hierarchy here, ladies and gentlemen, because we need to actually protect ourselves from this. I mean, to me, what's interesting about what, what's happening right now with the internet, besides the fact that you're absolutely right about this bubble, is that the net itself is creating the spaces to, to, for network effects to occur. Right? I mean, the, the basic network effect is a so-called fax effect. When only two people in the world have faxes, the fax machine is a very useless, very expensive piece of machinery. The more people have faxes, even if the fax has not improved technologically, even if it's still the same crummy machine that came out, the, just the fact that there are more people with them uh, increases the use value of the fax itself, regardless of its own technological progress. When everybody has a fax, the fax machine has become extremely valuable. Now, of course, in the internet, they have realized this because the internet was built with free software. The software for email, the software for chat rooms, the software for um, B, you know, the bulletin boards, the software, of course, HTML itself, uh, and so on, where pieces of um, intellectual property that hackers from different parts of the world f gave for free to the internet. And of course, they, even though they did not reap the profits, there was a creation of wealth in the sense that the moment this, for some bulletin board software began just, just being given for free, spread like a wildfire, now it's the standard for bulletin board networks, which are the weediest part of the internet. You can shut down the web, you can shut down every single fancy server, you can shut down America Online one day, and, and the bulletin boards will still be there because they are not, even though they are connected to the internet, they are connected to each other, first of all. And so that part of the internet would be the weedy part, the part that you need extra strength herbicides to, to, uh, to eliminate, right? Uh, and the fact when Netscape came out with its product and gave it away, to, to, it, it, it was the first recognition by a corporation now that in fact this existed, that you could in fact profit from giving something away. And of course the best part was when it began being challenged by Microsoft Explorers, when it, it gave the source code of, of its browser away, because that is a totally hacker move. That has absolutely nothing to do with corporate mentality. You're not only giving a product away, you're giving the source of its intellectual property. And, and of course this is the open source movement in software in the internet, like Linux, for instance. To me it's amazing that the only real alternative to Windows as far as we can see in the, for, in, the, in, the, in the near future is Linux. Some version of Unix that is in fact not owned by anyone and and, uh, but subject to economies of agglomeration, all these hackers around the world changing it a little, improving it a little, and therefore making it into a pro the product cycle, making it so much more faster than anything that Microsoft can come up with. I mean, Microsoft is 
leg legendarily slow, right? And they took 10 years to copy the Mac. And, and, and the first Windows was still a piece of crap. So, so to me, what is interesting about this is that there's a certain speed differential between economies of agglomeration and economies of scale. Uh, the Emilia Romana, for instance, profits from the speed differentials because what they, they realize, remember I said they do ceramics and textiles, in other words, they are directly connected to fashion. They realize that the fashion cycles now are much faster than, any, that, than, the, way, than the amount of time that it takes you to change an assembly line. Therefore, if you're producing the standard runs of products you know, to reap economies of scale, you are too slow for the fashion cycles. It's, you need much nimbler, more flexible, smaller companies that can keep up and make changes in a faster pay, at a faster pace. So what we're witnessing right now is a variety, precisely this history with all the speeds that I was talking about, is a realization of this, of, of the world as a world of speeds. Indeed, Brodel calls towns, particularly towns during the feudal period, accelerators of historical time, because that, that's in fact all they were. They were these towns rising right in the middle of feudalism, but within which certain kind of temporary autonomous zones were formed where history could go at a slightly faster speed. Some, for instance, uh, forms of sexism, the, the, the institution of guardianship, according to which women could not choose their husbands, but had to be the male brother or father that chose the husbands, were first given up and eliminated within the cities. Many new, a new middle class was created, and therefore an intermediate class between the rich and the poor was created within the cities. In other words, actual real social experiments were carried out within these temporary autonomous zones, thanks to the fact that they were giving history a slight acceleration. And so we're beginning to think precisely in terms of speeds, in terms of differential speeds. And what the internet makes very interesting is precisely that by making speeds basically zero, by cutting costs of distribution, of the, of distribution and by allowing a product to be developed in a, in a decentralized form around the world, is allowing the creation of new paradigms which uh, despite the fact that these bubbles that you just mentioned are indeed a danger to it, I, I believe that it has more resilience and more robustness, more weediness that, uh, that we give it credit for. And uh, I, at least that I have a, a certain amount of optimism as to you know, how the internet can indeed allow economies of agglomeration one day to overtake economies of scale. Do I see all the hands? Yes? Okay, well, that is, again, that's another, I can recommend you a book. It's, the name is uh, The New Competition by Michael Best. He has, dedicates a whole chapter on Emilia Romana, to Emilia Romana, rather. But then he has another chapter on Japan and the completely different way in which this symbiosis between the small and the large has taken place there. Uh, the, their la the large corporations like Sony, Mitsubishi, and so on have in fact allowed small businesses and indeed networks of small businesses and suppliers to survive instead of digesting them, eating them and digesting them, like, as it ha happens here, in order to keep them, in order to keep this, in other words, ma it, Economies of scale are run by managers. The manager from PepsiCo that came to Apple. These are a standard, uniform class of, of, of similar mentality people. They are very different from the entrepreneur. But also precisely because a manager is a manager of a joint stock company, and a joint stock company is one in which ownership has been divorced from control. Now joints, the stock is dispersed among many people, and the managers are hired guns that come from other places. There is not motivation for the owner and the visionary to stay in and, 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 and give a certain vision, a certain style to the company. So large corporations are trying to recapture entrepreneurship one way or another, the energy of entrepreneurship. And they, the only way they, they, they know how to do it is by dominating. 
other companies by somehow subordinating them to themselves. So that is also another thing that's going to happen. And that's why the, the Japanese case is very interesting, as, as described by Michael Best in that book. Because there, the networks exist, but they have absolutely no chance of ever becoming like Emilia Romana. Now, Silicon Alley, on the other hand, might have a chance because New York has become a traditionally, a res a, a, a attracts so many young artists from all over the world that it is a reservoir of talent right there. It's, it's a reservoir that's being mostly channeled to create uh, fine art. But game companies or any other kind of video or, 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 or uh, digital entertainment company that moved there would have you know, it already has this kind of reservoir of talent that, that is the hardest part for a region to, to get started. Whether that would automatically break the, the control that large corporations have over New York is, is, is anyone's guess. But I mean, the, what's exciting about all this is precisely that this new vision of history, you know, when we had the old vision of history in which in which all the ages follow one another, you know, agrarian, industrial, information, and so on. It all seems so kind of given and so running by itself that we had very little chance to move. Now, this new vision of history allows us to begin to see that, in fact, history never happened that way. That, in fact, at the same time that the Industrial Revolution was happening in England, uh, there were systems of, of, of uh, economies of agglomeration, network economies in Switzerland and other Alpine regions, producing quite sophisticated products like cutlery, watches and so on that stuck to their own skill-based traditions that did, that fit better e with the ecosystem even because large factories of course have all kinds of hidden costs as far as you know they have to reroute uh, rivers and therefore they dry up certain places they, the mining of coal eventually you know decades later it turns out to be like terrible for the ecosystem whereas if you have small businesses they are, it's a better mesh you know, with, with the place where you are. And those paradigms were there and continue to be there, only our economic histories don't even tell us anything about them because we are so impressed by the Industrial Revolution and so impressed by the fact that we think it was a necessary age that, that we forget about those things. These new visions of history that Brodell are beginning to give us, to me, give us hope. Even though, on one hand, it makes it look makes the, the project look harder than the 60s thought it was going to be, or anybody else for that matter. It's not a matter of revolution. It's a matter of constant experimentation and creativity. And so it makes it more complex on one hand. But on the other hand, it gives you much more optimism that it can be done, because history now seems so much more complex and heterogeneous that we never tried many of the things that we could have tried. Plus, once you give up the idea that there is this linear progress of agriculture, industrial, informational, then looking back at, for instance, Switzerland in the, in the, in the 18th century and try to learn from those, or, or, or like Jane Jacobs you know, does, looking back to Venice in the 9th century for this import substitution dynamics, is not nostalgia anymore. It would be nostalgia if indeed history proceeded in a teleological way with a goal towards the future. But if history has always been this parallel computer with all these streams going on independently, you can very easily go back and check solutions that were proposed at some point and not given a chance and try to revive them in a new way or in a new implementation so that, so that it makes it harder and easier at the same time. Yeah? Well, I mean, that is, that is the danger, right? I mean, that is precisely the future that we would want to try to avoid. I mean, unfortunately, economies of scale do work. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not as if we were saying, well, that is an obsolete paradigm. It's not an obsolete paradigm because it actually works. Uh, it's just that it, it, relative to the speed at which other processes are going, is becoming slightly out of phase. And so, uh, I mean, it, it, you may mention Disney, I could mention biotechnology. You know, biotechnology was originally entrepreneurial based in, in Boston and so on. And now, if, of course, all the oil companies and all the food companies and so on are buying all those startups and absorbing into them and making everything much more dangerous. Because one thing 
biotechnology as it is, is dangerous. You're fooling around with genes, you're changing gene sequences, you're unleashing genetically modified organisms into the environment, not knowing what's going to happen because that's a, a whole complexity on its own. But when, a, when, a, when the same company that owns an oil division and creates pesticides and herbicides owns the seeds and begins to own all the inputs that go into the farm, then you have an, an institutional encroachment on the very, at the very core of the food chain, which is not a viable option for anyone. I mean, this is, this is, this is suicide for humanity if we allow this to happen. So, so that, uh, I mean, this is one reason to be weary about the future because, you know, the, unfortunately, large economies of scale do have a head start particularly because they combine this military aspect of industrial discipline with the, with the scale of the Industrial Revolution and did come up with a wealth generating paradigm that, that does work. And now they dominate the population of institutions. Uh, Emilia Romana, Silicon Valley, they are, they are you know, uh, exceptions to the rule. So it is, it is impossible to tell whether we are too late trying to save this or in fact, the clock can be can be turned back, and uh, and and governments, for instance, can begin to realize that multinational corporations now are more powerful than they are, and that in fact the only chance for the nation state to survive with certain integrity is to begin seeding itself with regional economies that cannot move or go anywhere, because much as General Motors, Chrysler, and so on are city killers in the sense that they can close the plants in Flint and put hundreds of thousands of workers out of work with just one pen stroke. Now corporations are becoming, multinational corporations are becoming so much more larger that they can in fact become nation killers at that stage. They can move out of a nation, go into a Caribbean island, establish their, their bases there, and not having to worry about the nation state anymore. So that nation states themselves should realize that their only hope for the future is to begin seeding fertilizing, uh, 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 facilitating the bootstrapping of regional economies that precisely cannot move anywhere and therefore cannot hold the state hostage to like, like the way corporations can. Well, rather, rather this, the domination of the population of institutions, that, that they, they reach a critical mass where, they're, where there's no way of dislodging them anymore. Okay, let me, let me just ask. Well, I mean, Emilia Romanas would help third world countries. I mean, if, if, if we could just develop the, uh, the, the right theory so that the, their governments would understand that this is indeed avant-garde, sophisticated, more scientific economics than the ones they learn in school. I mean, let me put it this way. I come from Mexico. The last few presidents of Mexico have been educated in Chicago until, under Milton Friedman, who of course teaches the other type of economics. Everything is a free market, it doesn't matter the size, doesn't matter, a corporation is exactly same thing as a small business, only this is perfect competition, this is imperfect competition. And this entire mythology, which is totally unscientific about what economies are, they go back, back to Mexico and they begin, of course, promoting big businesses. And in fact, now Mexico has lost most of its small businesses. They, you, it, you know, Mexico is an extremely creative country. Every single state, the, hum, the most humble individuals have a style. They create folk uh, art and so on that is different from state to state. There's an enormous reservoir of talent to be tapped there. But of course, it's not going to be tapped by the large corporations that are of Mexican origin or not, now dominating the population. If instead we could convince the governments that that economic way of thinking is basically voodoo, that it has absolutely no basis on reality, neither in history, that it does not match the data, and, it, and not, nor in mathematics, because as I said before, the mathematics that tell you what happens in, in a large number of small businesses is completely different than game theory that, a lot, that, that, that tells you the rivalry, that models the rivalry between, an, between three oligo, oligopolies. And so if we could do this and, and in fact scare them as to the fact that these multinational corporations will eventually kill the state, they could perhaps one day 
begin to realize that their only way out is to re-inject knowledge and creativity into their own land by creating this, this regional economies that are based on these reservoirs of knowledge created by doing things and, and replacing imports and creating own local production of things. Yeah? Okay, well, I would not break it down that way, obviously, since I don't think that there was ever this one factor that did this or that did that, right? I mean, I, again, the whole view, the new view of history is precisely to try to view this as several parallel streams of history, uh, which religion might have played a very important role at the individual level and perhaps at the institutional level, or perhaps not so much at the urban level, at, at a level at which the, the difference between landlocked capitals and gateways, for instance, was more important there. Very little to do with religion and more with economics. But on the other hand, I don't think that you can divorce them either because Emilia Romana was able to take off the bootstrap there. The magic happened because they had this leftist cultural trust. There was a reservoir of trust there. Without which, the whole idea of, okay, let's compete in terms of design, but everybody promises that they're not going to grow large and try to compete in terms of cost. Yes, okay. We, without that, no one would believe that, that the other guy is not going to try to sneak in and, and, you know, there's always free riders. We cannot possibly count on idealism to pull this off. The idea is to try to develop thing, systems that are robust enough that even with free riders, that even with the occasional betrayer, with the occasional non-player, it will be resilient enough to work, even without that. And part of that, you know, it could be religion. I personally would not be opposed to the fact that if a particular region, due to its religion background, has created a, a kind of community life uh, that's tight and that's, that's, that's well interweaved and so on, that would be a good place to start an Emilia Romana, regardless of the fact that it was not my favorite ideology that happened to create those conditions. Because you need that reservoir of trust as a bootstrapping necessity. You can get, you can, you're going to have to go get it wherever you can. Uh, on the other hand, I don't see religions disappearing as a, pot as a potent force of, of, of historical change any time. I think that, that the internet will disappear first and uh, Islam and Judaism and Christianism will still continue to fight thousand-year-old fights uh, uh, into the future and for once, once the internet has already become a thing of the past. So you, again, we're talking about all these different streams of history going at the same time at different speeds and religion will continue to be one of those for for a long time to come. Yeah? Well, I mean, it could be, it could be both, right? I mean, modernism itself, already became a homogenizing force worldwide. I mean, there's, there's, there's no doubt about that. You go anywhere and you see basically the same homogenized style of building and, 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 and designing. Uh, on the other hand, precisely just like gateways, gateway cities like Venice by, by allowing Islamic influences to coexist with, with Christian uh, influences created its own architectural styles, like specifically Venetian Gothic. Uh, 
these mixtures of different cultures, as long as there's no reduction to a common standard, as long as what we are trying to do is revalue the role of diversity and heterogeneity, which is precisely what this talk was all about, you know, to, to try to say that not only homogeneity is, is overrated, that it is downright barbaric. That Taylorism, far from being scientific management, is, is, is a Stone Age management. That the whole idea that you can replace everything with centralized commands and centralized decision making is so unstable that in fact it won't ever have the resilience and, and robustness of, of a true ecosystem where so many diverse species are connected into a food chain. It, perhaps if we, be, if, if we begin to become conscious of the value of diversity, whereas in the past we have seen it as a, as, a, as, a, as a nuisance, as a political nuisance. For instance, linguistic diversity has seen in many countries as a source of problems, which in fact they are. I mean, in Canada they do have problems because of linguistic diversity with secessionism of French Quebec. They are having the same problems in Belgium because they also have uh, Dutch and, uh, and, and French. Uh, and so it is not easy to put heterogeneities together. In fact,